Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to start by thanking Rakesh and Codex for having me today. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about cybersecurity. It's obviously a near and dear subject to my heart. I think it's also fair to say it's getting a little more attention now than ever before. And specifically, I'm going to focus on this question of has digital innovation effectively made it impossible to live securely? So I want to take you through a story or a journey talking about what it is that we're trying to protect and why it's so difficult to imagine being able to do it successfully. Um, this concept of setting ourselves up for failure, I think my story is going to speak to that. So let's start with a pop quiz. And I promise I'm not going to call on anybody. Nobody has to actually get up and answer the question out loud. But I wouldn't mind if you'd raise your hand. So 90% of all of the data that exists in the world today was created in the last, and I'll give you three choices, two years, five years, or eight years. How many people think 90% of the data that exists today was created in the last 24 months? Eight years. OK, nobody at eight. So it turns out most of you actually got it right, which is great. The answer is that 90% of the world's data was created in the last 24 months. And for those of you that are sitting there trying to get a logical view of that, I want you to think about something. Can I assume everybody here has a smartphone in their pocket? Can I assume that most of you have more than 100 photos? Some of you might have over 1,000 photos. You probably took most of those pictures in the last two years. Think about your daily life. Think about your checking account. Think about your medical visits to your doctor. Think about the photos you take with your phone walking around London or Paris or New York. It is not difficult when we think about how we're living every day to imagine that 90% of the data that exists in the world was created over the last couple of years. So I want to go a step further. I want to relate that to cybersecurity. When you think about protecting anything, physical, cyber, it doesn't matter, the first thing you think about is not how are you going to protect it. You think about what it is. And so when it comes to cyber, one of the concepts that everybody's trying to get their hands around is how big is the attack surface? How big is this thing we're trying to protect? And specifically, how fast is it growing? So let's talk about that. And I'm going to try and relate it to something that we all can sort of remember because it's something we deal with every day. One gigabyte. Right, So you go and you get your new iPhone, and it's got 16 or 32 or 64 gigs of storage. One gigabyte related to music, 16 hours. It's a lot of music. As data's exploded, we obviously have a taxonomy now that helps us to describe very large amounts of information. One zettabyte equals 2 billion years of music. So you can think about it now in terms. 2 billion years of continuous music. How much data exists in the world? In 2013, it was estimated that there were 4.4 zettabytes of data out there. And what's terrifying is that over the next decade, they expect that that number is going to go to 180. If you think about that in terms of an attack surface, it's literally unfathomable. You couldn't imagine what you would do to secure it, what money you'd spend, what tools you'd buy, because it's unfathomably large. And if you want to get a sense how fast it's growing, every two days, it's estimated that we're creating as much information as was created from the beginning of time until 2003. So it's not just how big it is, it's how fast it's growing. So the attack surface is creating a problem that none of us ever anticipated. All this innovation, all of this technology is putting us in a position where it's not just how do we secure it. it actually, you should start with the question, can it be secured? And where I want to go from here is I want to talk about that strategy. We've had a strategy for security for 30 years. And the strategy could be boiled down to a single sentence, which is effectively this. Keep the bad things out. We have these environments, data centers. Now we have places like public cloud. And we store all this valuable and often sensitive and critical data, all of these valuable and critical applications. And our strategy for cybersecurity, all the money that gets spent on it, generally has been spent for one thing. Keep the bad things out. OK, so let's look at it. And let's look at it through numbers. 2010 give or take $40 billion of cybersecurity spend six years later, double. Maybe the problem is that we're buying the wrong tools. Maybe it turns out that we're not innovating fast enough. We're putting all the money into the old way of securing things. And maybe if we innovated faster in cybersecurity, we wouldn't have these big breaches. Well, unfortunately, the data doesn't help there either. If we look at the cybersecurity startup investments, so theoretically the money that goes into the real innovation, 2010, it was a little under a billion dollars. And here we are six years later, and it's 4x. So it's not just that we're buying a lot and increasing how much we spend. We're also investing a lot to try and innovate. And you can guess what the third graph shows. It's not working. Matter of fact, it's failing fairly spectacularly. We doubled the spend, quadrupled the investment, and the rate of breaches is going up faster than it ever has. And this is just the public breaches. There's obviously all the ones that we don't hear about. 
that we don't see about that don't get reported. So there's a quote. When you look at these three graphs side by side, there's a quote that I think sums up this slide perfectly. And it's a pretty profound quote, but it shouldn't be a surprise because it's literally a genius who said it. I'm sure some of you have seen this before. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. We doubled the spend, we quadrupled the startup investment, and yet the breaches keep happening. And arguably, they're getting bigger and they're getting worse. So something's not working. The model that we used in the past, it may not be wrong, but it's not enough. And the question is, what has to change? And the way that I want you to think about it is, how did we get here? How did we get to this place where we're spending all this money, and yet we're experiencing these breaches? They're bigger, and they're worse than they've ever been. And where are we going to go from here? What can we change? What can we do differently? What can we add to the model to give us a better shot at living securely? So I have a picture that I love. Um, I say the word submarine, and it doesn't matter who it is, even my five-year-old daughter back in California. When you say the word submarine, everybody gets that picture in their head of the hull and the little periscope or the pop-up at the front of the ship. It's one of those instant picture-in-the-head words. But in this case, relative to cyber, it's a really great way to think about what's going on nowadays. So you look at this picture of a submarine, and it's generally accurate. It's actually not perfectly accurate. And when you look at it, you realize something. That if a submarine was built this way, and it even had a tiny little leak, that little pinhole at the back, water would drip in through the hull. And eventually, if you left it this way long enough, it would fill up. Now, if you poke a bigger hole up at the front, let's say one the size of a football, the water's going to come in much faster. And eventually, no matter how big or small the hole is or where it is in the hull, the sub is going to fill completely with water, and we all know what happens next. It sinks. You want to get on that submarine? And the reason I ask that question is because, generally speaking, the holes are actually built really well. They're strong. They're sturdy. You walk up to it, you bang on it, it sounds pretty solid. Most people trust the hull. But the question is, do you trust it 100.00% of the time? Do you trust that that hull and that hull alone is the only thing standing between you and that thing flooding and sinking with you on it? And the truth is, most people don't want to bet their life on that. They want to have a backup strategy. They want to have something else that will save them in the event that that hole fails, even if it only happens a very, very tiny percentage of the time. If you don't trust that submarine hull, then my question for you is, why do you trust putting your most sensitive data inside of a data center that looks like this? And the reason that I bring this picture up is because this picture is effectively every data center that we've built for the last 30 or 40 years. It's sort of like a submarine. The hull is the perimeter. It's sort of the brick wall that we build around the outside. Not the actual brick wall, but the brick wall that we build in terms of the perimeter that puts all these valuable servers and VMs inside with all of these applications and all of our critical data on them. And then we hope that the hull holds. The hull in the cyber world is the firewall or the string of firewalls and the other devices that we've put up. And our job is to try and make sure that nothing bad ever gets in. Back to that investment thesis. Don't let anything bad inside. Except the problem is that when something bad does get inside, and it really doesn't matter how it gets in, it doesn't really matter where it goes once it's inside, when you build a submarine or a data center like this, once something gets inside, it effectively can go anywhere. Or in the worst case scenario, it can actually go everywhere. And this is actually the model that we've had. When you read about all of these breaches that you see in the newspaper, the common thread that you read every single time is that something got inside and was there for a long time and no one knew it. And it actually entered on something that wasn't all that important, but because they were able to move around, they finally found the most important thing, and that's when they walked out the door with it. You hear that story again and again. It's just like the submarine. One drop, and they just keep adding up. So you look at this and you say, what do we have to do differently? This does not work. We don't need any more evidence. We've seen enough. What could we do to change the security model that makes it such that every time there's a breach, it doesn't result in epic disaster or catastrophe for customers, for citizens, for everybody. And the one thing that I want you to think about is we talk about changing behavior and how difficult it is, but the reality is that when our security is on the line, we're actually more willing to do it than you think. I'll prove it to you, and I'll go back to the phone in your pocket. I think we can all agree that consumer companies, one of their absolute core tenets is to remove friction from the process. They want their customers to be able to move and work with them as easily as possible. I assure you that putting this on my iTunes account or making me use two-factor authentication with my Gmail or Facebook is not the definition of removing friction. As a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. But I do it. I do it because I know that if I don't, it's very likely that at some point I'm going to get popped and all of my information is going to go with it. 
In other words, we've proven that we're willing to change behavior when we know that our security is on the line. As consumers, we've already done it. As enterprises, unfortunately, we haven't been quite so quick to embrace it. And so I want to give you a different way to think about security, what it should look like. Well, here's your submarine again, except this one actually looks like the way we build them in real life. And the reason we do that is because we understand that the hull does hold 99.9% .9 of the time. But we don't want to bet the lives of everybody inside that it holds 100% of the time. Now you get your leak, and all of a sudden, it's still a leak. Got the second leak too, and it's a problem. The ship doesn't sink. Those compartments saves everybody's life inside. And if you need the picture of the data center to bring it home, this is what it's supposed to look like. And by the way, more and more often, this is what it does look like. There's actually a little hope in the story. And it's happening because customers understand that they need to hold the companies that they do business with accountable. <coughs> Citizens understand that they need to be able to hold the governments that have their private information accountable. And regulators, believe it or not, are actually understanding that part of their job <coughs> is to make sure that this information stays safe. So how do we do it? We segment. We compartmentalize. We take the lessons that we learned in the physical world for many, many years, and we apply them to this world. The exact same theory and strategy just simply applied in cyber. By chopping up this environment, I can't promise you that something won't get sick, but I can promise you when it does, it isn't going to take down the entire ship. And this is called segmentation. The word that you hear when you talk about it in the cyber world is either segmentation, sometimes it's called compartmentalization, and if you think about the highest value assets, you'll even hear the concept of ring fencing them. Literally building a wall around the most sensitive things that we have or the most sensitive data that we store in an effort to make sure that if something gets sick, not everything gets sick. So with that, I want to wrap up, but I want to wrap up by talking not about the technology or about segmentation, but about why this all matters so much. So security, in a lot of ways, was given a mission a long time ago, and cybersecurity specifically was given one mission. As I said, it's keeping bad things out. I think that those days are over. And when I say that, I want to be really clear. I don't think that the mission of keeping bad things out should ever go away. But assuming that cybersecurity has one and only one mission, which is to keep bad things out 100% of the time, is a fool's errand. Security actually now has two missions. Mission number one is to try and keep bad things out as much as possible. And I think we'll get that right, actually, not all the time, but more often than not. Mission number two is we have to reduce the surface area of attack that we've created. I think we can all agree that the innovation cycle, if you want to call it, that we're in, it's not going away. As a matter of fact, it's getting bigger and speeding up every day. Cybersecurity now has a second mission, which is to reduce the surface area of attack and make it possible to innovate and use all of this technology to live and enable our life, but do it in a way where we can assume that we will be secure most of the time, and when we miss that it won't be catastrophic. And to conclude, I think that it's important to remember that cybersecurity, although we tend to talk about it in very technical terms, and those of us that live it every day talk about the technology more often than anything else, but there's actually a much bigger message here. And the bigger message is that cybersecurity equals trust. There is no doubt about it that we have obviously enabled everything in our lives. And I love the washing machine example and the toaster example because that drives the point home. We've enabled everything in our lives with technology. Our checking accounts, our personal lives, how we talk to family and friends, our medical records when you go to a doctor, everything is enabled through technology. If we don't trust the systems that we're building and using every day, there is no way that we will be able to continue to operate like this. And I think Warren Buffett really said it well when he said that it takes 20 years to build a reputation and just five minutes to destroy it. Think about what it's like when you do business with someone for years and all of a sudden they experience a catastrophic breach. Think about what it's like when you question whether or not the election results that you're reading about are actually valid. Cybersecurity is no longer a technology only issue. It has to do with literally how we live our lives and it has to do with whether or not we trust in the systems that we use. And I think that we're going to find that you're going to see an enormous amount of change in how we do this over the next few years. So thank you very much for having me.